happy Tuesday, everybody. This is quite random. Uh, we are joined this evening at Growth RX by Giles Geyer all the way from the UK. Now, this Hello. recording was meant to go live on Thursday, but with the time differences, we thought we would surprise you and appear here on a Tuesday evening in Australia and round about, what, 9.30 is it over there, Giles? It, yeah, it's about 9.30 in the morning here in a beautiful, sunny uh, London. So we Sorry. were going to record this and post it into the group on Thursday. I'm just going to check out the group now and see whether we're in there. Yep, there we are. So firstly, I wanted to give you a bit of an introduction that you deserve. You're a bit of an enigma here over in Australia. You're a UK-based author, researcher, international lecturer in manual therapy. Your background, you've got a degree in osteopathy yeah. and you've been published yeah. in multiple technique based textbooks for osteopathy but also for chiropractic and I guess when it comes to manual therapy what I love about you is you're pragmatic and you're a realist when it comes to delivering evidence and you know you've got over 15 years of experience in the industry doing this um, and so I think you're well equipped to be talking to us about manual therapy as a whole particularly with your education background and what you're doing with graduates over there in the UK have I missed anything no no I think um, that's about it really to be fair yeah we um, we've spent a long time writing and researching and we do a lot of teaching so for us it's great to, to to work with lots of other professions it's quite quite good fun really but yeah that's about it really and you are the face, along with many other practitioners, but behind OMT. So you can find you on Instagram and also on your website, but we'll go into that a little bit later. On some yeah, time. yeah. Tinder, sort of various other dating apps. You can find me, you know, the usual. <laughs> So we are this evening talking about manual therapy, the concerns, the future, the evidence, the research behind all of it. It's been quite a hot topic of, of late here. There's been mm. a recent discussion that um, between Daniel Meekins and Chad Cook that was, you know, hosted and facilitated really, really well last week. Now we Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw it. Last year. Um, and all of a sudden now manual therapy is in the limelight for a lot of reasons which we're going to sort of go through and deep dive into but let's probably start off with a, a bit of a definition which is is really conflicting is you know what is manual therapy most agree that it is specific it's a skilled technique by a qualified practitioner but it is hard to object objectify because it has different outcomes different application varying rationale diverse techniques, diverse settings, where, where are you positioned with the definition of manual therapy? Well, there are the same technique with different philosophies, that you're, depending on your educational background and how you come into it. Ma manual therapy, I think, I think we're overcomplicating it massively. Manual therapy is applying some form of physical touch, some physical attribute to something or someone to help reduce their pain and discomfort. We were, we were saying it earlier, like my kid fell over yesterday and I picked them up and I rubbed the area of pain and they felt better. That, that's manual therapy. That is the essence of manual therapy. Uh, it's, about, it's about introducing some form of manual stimulus, physical stimulus um, to work with someone or something, I guess. But I think we overcomplicate it, trying to look too much or too deeply into something that should really be quite simple if that makes sense yeah absolutely and oh, let me just change my view back here again i think you know i guess the one common thread is here is that it's delivered passively and it's generally referred to as hands-on so whether it's soft tissue mobilization manipulation stretching it's delivered by a practitioner whether you're being patient-centered or not it's still delivered by a practitioner with a particular and specific skill set. And I guess that's where you're versed in, in teaching manual therapy. Obviously, we see, I, I, well, I, I, I would disagree a bit because I think manual therapy, it can be passive, it can be active. The whole emphasis for me is that what the patient does off the table is probably more important than what we do on it. So the, the emphasis is that I'm going to use some form of passive intervention with, with uh, education and with clinical rationale. And then I'm going to empower the patient and get them doing what it is that we need them to do 
at home, creating self-reliance and self and self-treatment. So teaching them how to do this. So it's, it's a mixture of two. Manual therapy can be both passive and active. It can be on the table. It can be off the table. You know, I, I see, look, articulation or mobilization is, is a low velocity, low amplitude therapeutic movement that I can apply to a patient's spine. But I can also get them to do the same thing in an exercise setting in a gym and teach them to do self-mobilization, which is just as therapeutic. So I think manual therapy has a broad spectrum. And I think sometimes we try to pigeonhole it into one little box. It's a bit like chiropractic, right? We pigeonhole it as just cracking stuff, which is, which is a misconception because they cover a whole base of therapies and techniques. Osteopathy, like, you know, if you speak to the wrong person, they'll say it's all cranial or it's that focus. And actually it's a huge broad spectrum. So I think manual therapy can cover a wide diverse spectrum and you can fit into it what you like. I think it's incredibly flexible, very, very flexible, but I think we shouldn't overcomplicate it. Keep it simple. Yeah. And look, I, I definitely agree. And you're kind of jumping ahead with all my mm. questions and my materials. So we're going to dive in a little bit in that, you know, for, and we're very biased and we can, we can say that I have an osteopathic background, yeah. you know, 18 years experience, you've got 15 years experience. We kind of sit there and scratch our heads as practitioners when we see a lot of these debates between exercise based um, management and treatment and then manual therapy treatment. We, we've been doing both of those for a really long time. So the debate actually <laughs> confuses me somewhat. This is nothing new, right? This is the irony, right? This is like, it, I watched that video the other day with Adam and Chad. Now, Adam's a lovely bloke, right? I, I, I've met Adam. I've known Adam. Um, he's a really nice guy. And ironically, he, you know, people see him as a bit of a pantomime villain, but he's not. And, and he's rightly challenging a lot of stuff, and, and rightly so. But um, ultimately we've been doing this for 15 years this this is not new uh, like manual therapy is not new manipulation is is not new the, you know no, we haven't invented this um and we've been talking about this for 15 years that's the irony is i think it's it's sort of it's coming back into fashion i'm waiting for flares to come back you know what i mean it's uh, you know what i'm saying like it will we'll stop here and then all of a sudden we'll all we'll be in bum bags and shell suits you know what i'm saying it's like it it it's, it blows my mind because we've been talking about this for so long. Yeah. Um, may, maybe it's just the flavor of the day. So there's nothing else to talk about. We're just recycling old thought processes. Yeah. And I think, look, some of the debate that we are seeing does, I guess, correlate back to physio and the training behind physio. And we're going to look at that a little bit more when yeah, yeah, yeah. we discuss some, some tribal leadership mindsets that I'm seeing with my background. So we'll kind of leave that to the end. But you did mention manipulation. Classic, let's throw it in the <sighs> bucket of manual therapy. You are a self-confessed or you have a self-confessed love for manipulation. Wow. You have done a lot oh. of research in this area. Please tell us more about your background in HVLA. You have suggested that there is no magic bullet. HVLA manipulation is certainly not a quick fix or a magic fix. But, you know, what are we seeing with some of the misconceptions and misunderstandings of manipulation and, and high velocity, low amplitude techniques? Well, I mean, I, 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 I do love manipulation. I, I do, right? I can't help it. When, um, when it's done really well, manipulation it looks lovely it can be gentle it can be effective you can get some great results when it's done badly it's like a fucking car crash it is brutal it's aggressive and it's like i, I mean i watch some stuff on social media with my like this and i'm like what on earth are you doing to your patients it's not prison it's clinic um it breaks my heart manipulation is just a tiny tiny tool in in a massive toolbox and yeah i, I like manipulation i love mobilization the two together is, is is a fantastic technique but it is just a tiny part of the treatment process so i always say to students look i'm going to teach you manipulation it's not a problem but don't forget everything else don't become this sort of, don't become a crack addict. Yeah. Don't, don't just crack it and see you later because that's missing the point. Um, I, I've done a lot of mini, uh, research into manipulation because it's taught so badly. It's, it's, and right. And this is where manual therapy is challenged and rightly so is because there's so much bullshit being put out there 
on social media, on Facebook, through various professions, talking about things that they cannot back up. They are purporting to do things that they cannot do when in reality, it's an effective way of, of creating symptomatic modification. I'm going to crack your back because I want you to feel a bit better and move a bit better. I'm not cracking your back to change your systemic disease or improve your immunity or, or stop you from fucking having erectile dysfunction. I'm not cracking your back to, sorry, I'm not cracking your back to change your chakras. I'm using it as part of a tool, as a segue into what is uh, exercise rehab, tissue resilience, loading a structure, creating a positive mindset, engaging with the patient, a holistic approach, nutrition, education, you know, the, the, big, the big things that we need to look at. Um, I, I, I think it's got a very valid part in treatment. It's taught badly. It's trained badly. It's, a, it's aggressively taught sometimes. And people are still stuck in this very old school biomechanical paradigm of repositioning stuff. And do you know what? Adam has a valid point, right? When a therapist stands up on social media saying, I can feel one degree of one mil of movement of the sacroiliac joint. I can crack your back into position. I can change your biomechanical skeletal positioning, it, you know, or when, the, when someone stands up there saying I can improve your immunity or, or this is a vitalistic, I'm, I'm doing a divine intervention and I'm clicking your back and I'm repositioning this joint. I get it. Right. I really do. And we, we have a duty to basically, freaking tell these people and tell the public that's not what's happening because i get patients coming into me saying oh can you just reposition my back can you put this back in can you do that and i have to say to them oh social media is a bit of a problem because i have patients will come to me and say i've seen you on social media doing this technique i want you to do it to me that's what's going to fix me and i'm like mate i can't fix anything i'm not fixing anything right i'm not going to fix your problem i'm going to help you manage it and i'm going to help you manage it and I'm going to help you have pain-free days for as long as I can. But when it does reoccur, potentially, you know, then we'll know how to deal with it. But I digress. But manipulation is great. It's very effective. I love it. It's got a valid part. It's not for everyone. It shouldn't be used every time you see a person. It should only be used selectively. But when it's done well, it's great to see. Couldn't agree more. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly in your cheer squad here. And I think to deliver it with such conviction like you do is, is what we need. We're, we're not sitting here saying that it's the be all and end all. It is a single no. modality that is delivered as Tiny. part of the wider process of, of treatment. And I, I, this is what confuses me the most is that there is probably only a select few who are suggesting that manual therapy is the be all and end all. If you've been, if you have been in, there in this generation who is watching the evidence, we need to move with the times and everybody is. So I don't know if there's anybody out there fla waving that flag anymore. That we just <laughs> do you know what? Mid back neck cycles and, and do the same thing to everyone. Surely that breed of practitioner is getting dated. They, they are dated. They are still out there. But my, my whole thing is that extreme views from either end is wrong. If you, are in, in ex, if you have an extreme view of biomechanical thought process, which has been disproven years, I mean, even, well, Ayo Lederman published, a re, 10 years ago, he published a research thing on, on, the, on the biomechanical myth, right? Um, if your extreme view here, you're wrong. If you are extreme view, evidence-based, the patient comes in and you say, man up and move, yeah, get out, do it yourself, um, you know, pain's in your brain, see you later, you're also wrong. We have to come together in the middle. And this is, this is a real big problem. People are, I mean, when I teach, I'm very much about respecting all of the professions because we all have something to give, right? I love writing with osteos, physios, and chiros. The research I did on manipulation was published with a, with, was published with a medical doctor from America, a, a physio, a PhD in neurology, physiotherapist, and two osteopaths. Collective knowledge for the wider profession. Uh, you know, if you have extreme views, you, you're, you're, you're not looking at the bigger picture. And I think you're wrong, ultimately. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that we see unfortunately in allied health is ego 
There's so much ego. And, and one of the things that I love and, and I, you know, I am a leadership nerd and what I'm seeing here is tribal leadership amongst the professions. You've got osteo, physio and chiro all doing, you know, some of this thing, you know, beating their chest. I'm the best. No, no, I'm the best. And our tribal culture over generations is part of our identity and so with confirmation bias, we want to prove that. We, we don't want to get to the end of a five-year course and then have somebody debunk everything that we've learned. Um, and particularly with osteopaths, I mean, we start over here in Australia, we start putting our hands on people, you know, at the end of our first year. We're practicing hands-on technique the, the whole way through. We are are equipped to come out and champion private practice, hands-on care mm. and manual therapy in private practice. But we also understand the need for exercise science and rehabilitation. One of the things that we're seeing, and I think the reason why some older school, and I don't mean to, to be disrespectful, are running scared is because this new breed of, osteo, of physiotherapists coming out go through the hospital system, go through the training system, and they get into private practice. They haven't touched a patient. So mm. this confirmation bias that we're seeing is how can you champion something when you are actually not experienced in it? So what you do is you use confirmation, you use evidence and you use research to support things that you are more experienced in and are more confident in. And you start to go down there. So what you were saying earlier about these toolkits they're, they're actually making judgment on something that they actually haven't delivered in private practice enough to be able to formulate a valid opinion. And, you know, yeah. some people are certainly going to argue with me and I'm, I'm, and I'm, and I'm saying this, I guess, with empathy towards some of these new graduates who don't know any different. You don't know not only what you don't know that you don't know, but you don't know <laughs> what you don't know. If, if <laughs> yeah, it does, it does, it does, it does, you know, it does. And our identity, you know, our identity is the security, our ego is the security guard to our identity. Of course, we're going to stand there and argue and, and validate our claims because that is part of our tribe. And that's what we do is we protect our tribe. And, and one of the amazing things, if you look at a talk, a, a talk that Dr. Victoria Brazil, she was incredible. She did a talk at, at SMACC Gold Conference in 2019 about this tribal leadership that we see. Mm. And she was talking more in the medical sector. So anaesthetists versus... Um, uh, I think it's in all sectors. Yeah. But she, she states, and I love this quote, and we should do this in allied health and healthcare more. We should be in competition with what is possible rather than each other. And if we, if we look to sort of unpack that, rather than fight against each other, and I guess this is the one thing that I love about Growth Rx, it's a platform where all allied health professionals come together and learn from each other rather than resisting and using that, that tribal mindset. What, what, do you, what are you seeing over there in the UK? Where are you positioned with this? Because I know... Look, look I mean, I, I, I've worked in about 47, 48 countries. So I've taught across the world. What I will say is that... Our, I've never seen so much ego in my life as I have in manual therapy. <laughs> and this is across osteo, physio, chiro. I mean, it's, it, you do get some significantly big egos, right? Um, I, I spent a five year degree doing my osteopathic program, being trained and being told that I was the Harry Potter uh, unicorn guru of manual therapy and that the chiropractors were rubbish. Physios were basically glorified personal trainers and that we were the top of the tree we were the echelons and i graduated after five years thinking i was this big fucking deal look at me i've got i've got osteopath i'm a big fucking deal and i got into clinical practice and i realized very very quickly that i wasn't i was working with physios chiros and that's how i, I got a lot of it into teaching because i went hold on a minute what you're doing is fantastic how do i learn how to do that and then i work with chiros that's amazing how do i do that it, and you know your ego shrinks significantly when you work with a practitioner who's who who out treats you outperforms you and that just pushes you to be better and better and better i i am not bothered about title anymore i don't care about title and i think if you, if this if if that I, i've got it on my t-shirt because you know you know trying to promote the brand but uh, if, if you are 
The only way you are ever going to survive is by adapting. It's not the strongest who survives. It's not the cleverest. It's the ones who are most adaptable. And by learning and working with other professions, you open your eyes to the bigger picture. And people respond to different things, right? That's why physios get results. Chiros get results. Osteos get results. Bloody Reiki healers get results. Homeopaths get results. If standing on your head for 10 hours a day cures your pain, crack on and do it. Um, you know, I think we need to work together rather than isolate between each other. And that's one of the reasons why I love working with other professions. I work with chiros and physios. I, I make a point of writing with other professions. I don't title my books for osteopaths. Nonsense. I want to title it for manual therapists. And I say that across the board because to, we are not silos. If we are on our own, we are an island and we are never, ever going to, we're never, ever going to move forwards, right? Ultimately, this isn't about my fucking ego. This is about the patient and about being able to provide as best care as I can. If I didn't work with other practitioners, if I didn't look at other stuff, I'd still be stripping down the IT band and trying to unwind your fascia, right? I would still be, you know, doing techniques that we know are not doing what we think they're doing. I still use those techniques, but I use them from a current modern thought process to try and elicit specific results. But we have to work together. And by isolating ourselves as these little islands, these little silos, it's going to do nothing but negatively affect all of our professions. Um, I, I love working with physios because when I work with a physio for two days, they go, fuck me, how do I do that? That's awesome, right? And, and I've been able to show them that Osteopaths are not these quacky, freaking holistic dream catchers. We're very, you know, we're very evidence based, very medically focused, and it's a great collaboration. I think osteo physio wedge it together, right? Have a beautiful therapy baby, and that's a fantastic therapist. That's oh. like, it's like the freaking Superman of therapy. Come together, don't separate. <laughs> this is one of the biggest concerns I have for osteopathy within my own bias. And I'm sure that there's, there's a lot of physios. I know Nick should see you're watching. And I know I've spoken to James Scumberg recently about this. New age osteopaths are the old school physio. And these private practice physios, these old school physios are cluing onto this. They're getting new graduates come out who don't want to touch, who don't want to place their hands on a patient. They're seeing osteopaths, who is the, the fastest growing allied health profession in this country. There is already a shortage. Wow. Physios can't get physios in private practice. Osteos can't get osteos in private practice. There's a wave of osteopaths coming out. And I've been approached by four physios in the last two weeks saying how do i get an osteo in my practice because osteopaths are trained for private practice we're trained to touch people. yeah this is the biggest yeah, yeah, yeah. we face in osteopathy is that physios are going to start hiring our graduates and <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't see that as a problem this, this is a concern of mine there's already three in the area and i know that some yeah. of these physio models are turning more to these these multidisciplinary, but physios are cluing on to the fact that osteopaths are brilliant with their hands and also we're smart enough to know that exercise prescription exercise rehab makes up a huge foundation of patient care of patient-centered care mm. and we learn communication empathy uh, the and and this is the one thing that we've seen and i know that you are, are going to back me on this one of the our seven human fundamental needs is patient contact. So whilst manipulation might have a short-term effect, touching people, there is so much evidence to support touching people. Physios, private practice owners, osteopathic practice owners have built the foundations of their careers, of their businesses on therapeutic touch. People want to be touched. And Professionally speaking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's me on the London Underground with my jazz hands. So, so, I mean, can, you, can you extend on, you know, we're meant to be talking about evidence and we're, we're both going off. No, you're, abs tonight, you're, absolutely, you know, you're, I, abs you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Now, the, the problem is, and, and I, do you know what? This pandemic has highlighted this a thousand percent. Like, oh, let, let's jump on like, you know, let's do Zoom appointments. Okay, they have their place and they can temporarily help. But the feedback I get is patients going to me, you know, I, when can I come back and see you? Look, touch, palpation, empathy is, is the fundamental, not just of clinical practice, but of human nature. 
It is of human nature to create a connection between you and that person, to create trust, rapport. And by standing off and having no connection with that person, to having no hands-on skills, I, I always remember hiring a physio years and years ago for one of my clinics. And ex-NHS physio, she was amazing, great therapist. Her first appointment, the guy complained. She assessed him, she diagnosed him, she charged him, she rebooked him. And the guy phoned me up and said, she didn't even touch me. She didn't even touch the area of pain. Um, you know, and, and it's a massive problem. <sighs> I, I love osteopathy because I think it covers such a broad spectrum for private practice. Patients want physical therapy. They want manual therapy. And when done right with evidence based and education and explaining, look, I'm not saying that manipulation is going to cure your problems. Uh, it's not. It's a temp Manipulation is a short term effect. It's tiny. It's temporary. It's a symptomatic and functional modification. But this allows us to get that person into a exercise rehab setting. If they come in and they're in pain and you don't even touch them, how are you ever gonna get them into a exercise rehab program? Do this exercise, but I can't because it hurts. Well, if you do it, it won't hurt, but, but I can't do it because it hurts, but do it and it won't hurt. You're in this cycle, reduce their pain, do what you need to do from any manual therapy technique that you're using and then back it up with your exercise rehab. That, that's what I love about osteos. I do feel sorry for physios in the UK because they're being trained to work in the NHS. It's not their fault. They're being trained to work in the NHS and, and the health service. They're being trained in this quite this, this restrictive way. Once they get into private practice, the, the curve is like this because as soon as they're in private practice and their patient numbers do that, because they aren't giving the patients what they, are, what they need or what they want or how to really liaise and, and engage with the patient, they soon learn very fast that, you know, you have to be all encompassing. You have to have this ability. And that's what I think osteopaths do very well is that we do cover all bases. Communication is so important. Look, communication is key. It is key. In fact, some of the best treatment you can do is not even touching the person. It's reassuring them, telling them they're going to be okay. Their legs aren't going to fall off. Uh, you know, because pain can be so scary for people. And sometimes just putting your hands on someone saying you're going to be all right is more therapeutic than trying to crack every joint in the body. Um, but if we if we if we stay away from it, you know, it, it's a real problem. Yeah. And, and you know, part, part of my reputation in education was built off good to great in private practice which literally yeah. is, is a course for allied health professionals where we don't actually do any technique at all. We talk about communication, delivery being key, empathy in a clinical setting, when to read book and how often. But ultimately, your reputation is built off your ability to create rapport and build trust. Oh, and listen, we look. We, we, by touching, placing our hands on people and, and therefore... What, neither of us are suggesting that there is not a place for exercise and exercise rehab oh, God, no. medicine. But if you're touching somebody, that trust and that rapport is built, is built faster and sooner. So then a patient may be more willing to believe and trust and feel empowered by your movement advice. And buy your we, we, yeah, we, look, ultimately what we need to do is we need to try and get that person to, we need to try to get them to move better, to feel better in a positive mindset. We need to load the area uh, consistently, create tissue resilience. And the only way we're going to do that is by creating an element of trust between you and that patient. If the patient, and, and I, I've had it where the patient comes in and there's just, is that, there's no connection there, or you've got this barrier, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's so important that you create that good rapport and communication is key. Look, I, I love clicking stuff all day long but but ultimately you know communication is is key with patients because like i said what they do what they're doing outside of your clinic room and bear in mind i see them for 30 minutes once a week right they've got seven days you know we've, we've got we've got a whole time outside of the clinic where we have to be making sure that they're doing something one of the big problems i see as well is that people are doing too much or they're trying to give their patients too much <laughs> simplicity is key but i say to my patients they're there going so how many exercises should i do and i'm like mate one percent man I, I want you to improve one percent every day and that makes a huge difference over time you, you know if i can get my patient to go for a 20 minute walk once a day without their phone that's a massive win for me it's something i can build upon um 
you know, I think we overcomplicate therapy. We overcomplicate stuff. Um, we need to keep, we need to bring it back to basics, keep things simple rather than trying to overcomplicate stuff. Communication is, is fundamental. It really, it really is. We could talk about this all day long. Sorry. I'll, I'll... No, no. And look, that is, that is one of the, the, the common ground that was met within that conversation with Chad Cook and Adam Meekins. It was, I need to say, it was really, really well facilitated, I thought, yeah. by Jared Powell. And, yeah. you know, no one is denying that sort of stuff. So I don't, is it, is it that there's some, just some big voices on social media who are, not not necessarily pandering to a minority, but but creating a, a bit of a stereotype for this minority and and giving it a big voice. You know, are, are there really practitioners anymore that you know? Of course, there's these old school practitioners. You come in, you get everything sort of cracked, and then you leave. Uh, they 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 are few and far between, I think. And so some of these debates do are they valid? I mean, with their conversations that we need to have. But, you know, are um, they meant to be getting the platform that they're getting? Look, I mean, firstly, I thought it was a really good video. I thought it was, good, it was a good discussion. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And ultimately, everything we've been saying for the last 10, 15 years was agreed upon. Manual therapy works. It has its place. Exercise works. It has its place. There is no one magic bullet. You know, I can't, there's no one magic cure. It's a combination of all of it. Communication is key. Patient focused, patient centered. The problem with social media is that a lot of it is nonsense. A lot of it, and I, I'm sorry to swear, a lot of it is clickbait bullshit. Um, and, and in reality, I, you, it's, a, it's a really difficult one because you see, you're only seeing 30, se 30 seconds of something. You're seeing these big cracks and clicks and you're seeing these, these crazy techniques that are being performed and you're not seeing the 30 minutes beforehand or the 30 minutes after you're not seeing the full picture it's all it's all sort of um it's all short term and i think there are some big egos and a, a lot of the time people are saying stuff just for controversy just for clicks just for likes I, I mean i'm seeing some weird stuff on social media people trying to do these weird manipulations and it's like it's purely for likes that's all it is i saw a guy trying to do a thoracic lift on a labrador this morning and i'm like what the fuck are you doing uh dude i'm like ah oh. uh i'm like seriously i kid you i'll send you the link and i'm like mate you know, I've stopped arguing now because you're never going to change someone's opinion on social media. It's like trying to play chess with a pigeon. What's the point? Um, for me, it's like, I mean, I, I put out as much content as I can in regards to the efficacy of what we do, the evidence base of what we do, um, you know, with the books and the research. But there are some, I think, <sighs> what I have seen is there are people in other countries that are looking at social media and are thinking that's the way they need to treat patients. And they're getting a, they're getting a, a, a very misrepresented view of what therapy is. And especially when I teach, I'm, I'm not going to sort of highlight specific countries, but I teach in certain aspects of Europe where things are not regulated. There's no standard education. And basically I'm seeing people getting Y strapped and fricking this, that and the other. And I'm like, well, what's your treatment? Oh, I'm just going to Y strap the guy and, and see him four times a week. And it's like, with the countries where education is regulated, university standards, allied health professions, it's this stuff doesn't happen. It really doesn't. But the world's a big place. Um, and I think we have a duty if we are, if we do have a large social media following to, to be honest about stuff and not talk nonsense. So I'm open to debate. I'm open to discuss and I'm open to say where I'm wrong and where I've changed. I mean, like if you saw me 15 years ago, I would have cracked you from the OA to the Hallux. I really would have because it was cool. I thought it was quite a cool thing to do and it was visceral. Patients were like, wow, it's amazing. 15 years later, hell no. Maybe one technique, two at the most, uh, if it's required and sometimes it's not. Uh, that's how we develop a change. So let's ju jump back to that evidence and research because I know that you're, you're well averse across that. There has been a definite shift over the last, you know, 10 years from this biomechanics standpoint to this neurophysiological um, yeah. paradigm, I guess you would call it, you know, where, where, where is the research? Oh, here we here. go. Here's the research. Here's the research. It's right in front of you. For God's sakes, woman. <laughs> can, you, can you extend on that for us for, for those, you know, playing at home and for new graduates out there, I think there's, you know, I, I work with the, a lot of the students at, at VU and I get a lot of questions. Yeah. 
there's a lot of students. There's actually some students watching right now. Michael OJ, thank you. He's the catalyst for this conversation in the first place, based upon some of your research. Um, and he had, you know, some questions behind that. If it is a short fix temporary care and we can't be segment specific, if the evidence is mm. showing us that, then, you know, why, why do it? Well, why do any? Well, uh, why, do, why would I do it? Why would I do manipulation? I do manipulation because it's a fast way to create symptomatic change. It's a I, I know that if I manipulate an area, you're going to feel better and you're going to move better. I can create functional change. Um, we can do similar and have similar effects with mobilization. We can have similar effects with, with soft tissue work and other stuff, but it'll take longer. It does take longer. Manipulation is, is a fast way to get a result. In, in, that's how I look at it. It's a, it's a quick way of doing it. But go back to your original point, how manipulation has changed from biomechanical to neurophysiology, right? The technique hasn't changed. This is, this is, this is the, the fundamental. The manipulation technique has not changed. How we are doing or why we are doing the technique has changed, right? I'm going to, um, like if we take the SI joint, for example, it's all very contentious. Um, if you'd have asked me 15 years ago, I would have manipulated your SI joint to posteriorize and anteriorize the ilium. I would have corrected your leg length. I would have biomechanically positioned you back, right? I would have, I, yeah, I would have done that because every time at university, that's what I would diagnose. I would test it and go, oh, it's terrible. Click, look at that. Aren't I magic? Um, 15 years later, I am still doing the same technique, but I'm not correcting skeletal position. I'm creating symptomatic modification, functional change, reduction in tone to allow the person to move and move better, feel better, so that we can then create tissue resilience through loading of the area so that we can ultimately stop that happening as often as it is. Does that make sense? So ultimately, the, the manipulation is still the same, but we are, we are not doing it with a thought process of 10 years ago. Like, I'm not going to strip your IT band with my forearm, right? I'm not going to strength, I'm not going to lengthen the fascia, I'm not going to change it, but I am going to gesture the IT band because I'm going to put stimulus into the paraspinal tissues. I'm going to create a sensation of empathetic touch. I'm going to help reduct, reduct, reduce the tone around it. I'm then going to work on the hips and the knees and all the other bits and pieces. I'm not stripping it down, but I'm still doing a similar technique. Does, does that make sense? So I, I think, it, and do you know what? I think it's awesome that we have moved into this neurophysiological mechanism. I love non-specific technique. Because it means I don't know where the fuck L5 is. I can just about palpate the lumbar spine, right? I can't feel anything. Uh, and, and I go, well, it's roughly about here. Prod it. Does it hurt? Yes. Then I'm probably on the right area. That way, I I'm not going to beat myself up like I used to at university when I try to manipulate L4 and I would get L5, L3 and L2. Um, I actually think it opens us up because... If there is a contraindication to manipulating L5, don't worry about it. Click T12 L1. You're still going to elicit some of the neurophysiological mechanisms without even having to worry about that segment. So I'm like, yeah, man, do it. I'm happy for it. I, I bring it on. It opens us up to be able to be less like Friat's law. Do you remember trying to be a transverse process? What a load of nonsense. My days, what a load of rubbish. I even wrote about that in the motion palpation misconceptions uh, that we published. And it was like, God. So I, I think it's a really good thing uh, that we are moving with the times. Like I said, the techniques haven't changed. They're still the same techniques, but we're able to say to ourselves, well, actually, I have efficacy. I know why I'm doing this from a neurophysiological mechanism. I think it's appropriate. This is the clinical outcome I'm expecting. How do I reinforce that? Well, I've clicked it. I've moved it. Now I'm going to load it. Now we're going to then see how we can educate and treat the patient from other perspectives. So I'm, I'm sorry, I digress, but I, I'm all right with it, man. I think it's a good thing. And, you know, and we do, we've got, we've found that there's no evidence for motion palpation, quiet's laws being debunked when it comes to segmental assessment. But it's still taught. Yeah. And these early philosophies haven't held up with modern times, no. particularly with, with a drive towards evidence-based medicine. You know, the lasting effects potentially aren't there. Yes, we can't be joint specific anymore. It is temporary, but it does come down to this therapeutic touch, which does have research attached to it. And I've heard you say once before, touch the skin, touch the brain. 
yeah know, yeah and, and it's true we connect with our patients so and then you know obviously there's these associated benefits when it comes to using manual therapy in conjunction with exercise so what you know one of my questions is and there's so many different philosophies of the same technique where do people fail when they use hvla or when when wouldn't you use hvla um you've got two different things here going on here i think firstly um people overcomplicate manipulation by trying to rigidly stick to biomechanical paradigms right if you honestly think that you're able to reposition a if you honestly think that thoracic like t4 is rotated left and side bent this way how the, how did you know where it started from right uh, how do you know you're on the specific level anyway so um i think people overcomplicate manipulation and and i think some of it is because of ego they've it, this is a simple technique that has 10 free effects but they've blown it up to be this amazing panacea for all because ultimately they've got nothing else that they can click a joint and they've got they're like polystyrene fucking therapists all shape and no substance right uh, like I, mean, I can click it but i can wobble it i can needle it i can strap it i can move it i can rehab it i've got an snc background i can do a lot right <laughs> if all i've got is manipulation it's like, it's like going to an acupuncturist if you don't like needles. What's the fucking point? Um, you know, people overcomplicate what is a simple process. It, what I, I honestly think manipulation is, it's basically therapeutic joint gapping, right? In essence, we're just gapping a joint to create a temporary effect. Most people, I think, overcomplicate it. They worry, t they, they overcomplicate it. They use too much force. They use poor biomechanics, poor practitioner positioning. They've been um, taught badly. They're, I always say the most important person in the room is the practitioner. And what I mean by that is, is that you have to look after your body mechanics. And I see people manipulating stuff all day long with terrible technique. Um, I, I think you don't have to be, I think the misconception as well is that manipulation and ego go like this, right? I've never seen so much ego as I have with manipulation and with manipulation teachers, right? It's like this big swinging dick. It's like, oh, it's, again, sorry for my language, but it's like, you know, it's ego, right? And you see, you see all these guys in the fourth and the fifth year of university just cracking people left, right, and center, and all the girls sat back going, oh, well, I can't do that. Well, it's a complete myth. I would always say, the best manipulative therapists are women, hands down. They haven't got brute force and ignorance to rely on, which is what blokes do. They have to have skill and finesse and biomechanics. Some of the best therapists I've ever worked with that are the most awesome manipulative therapists are small female practitioners. Finesse, finesse over force, position over power all times. And you know, and don't get pigeonholed into only using four or five techniques. There's a million ways of doing something. Now we know that we're non-specific, and now we know that we've got multitude of, of, of uh, ways of doing something. Don't worry about it. If they don't like going prone, do it supine. If they don't like going supine, do it prone or whatever. Yeah. You can, you've got so much flexibility. Take ego out of manipulation. Don't chase the sound of a crack because... If you're chasing the sound of the manipulation, you don't understand what manipulation is, right? If you think it's about brute force and power, go and go and just go to the gym. Yeah, work out your stress. In fact, when I say to my patients that are going back to exercise, leave the ego at the door. And that's the same for clinic. Leave the ego at the door, right? Don't, don't think about manipulation. And I used to do this. If I didn't get your joint to crack, I took it as a personal insult, right? And I would crack that 15 times until it did go like, uh, and the patient sort of hobbled out like, like freaking they'd been through the mill. You don't need to do that. You know, we manipulation. You need to be the sound, right? The crack. No, you don't. God, no. Crack. What, what's, the, what's the evidence tell us when it comes to the crack? You can see well, tissue change. Listen, the problem is, is that there's two folds. From a neurophysiological perspective, you don't need to hear the click for the effect to occur. From the patient's perspective, they sometimes need to hear the click. Otherwise, they think the technique's not worked, even if it has. So when I say to my patient, I'm going to click your back, I say, look, I'm going to manipulate your back. You may or may not hear a cavitation or a crack. That doesn't mean the technique hasn't been effective. You test it, you treat it, you retest it. Has there been tangible change? Has something occurred? If it hasn't, all right, 
you've got rationale to try again. If it has, my five. Take the win, tea and medals, happy days. Go do some exercise. See you next week. And, and as you say in your recording, and as, as Jeff rightly points out in the comments, if you are putting something back, oh. then, you know, you're so misguided. And yes, absolutely. You're, you're, you know, that, that is, that is you're using your authority and fear mongering and all those sorts of things that we are not as, as healthcare practitioners. If you're, as you say, if you're putting something back in, it was dislocated in the first place. Well, there you go. What is a subluxation? It's a part of dislocation. And I say to my patients, I'm not putting your joints back in. I'm gapping. It's a therapeutic gapping technique. But the, the, my biggest bugbear is people are still teaching this nonsense. There are, there are courses and lectures out there still teaching Friat's Law, still teaching old school biomechanical paradigms. And it's like, listen, guys, this is why manual therapy is getting a bad rap. And, and it's, an easy, it's an easy way to, 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 to lambast a whole profession with one bad, bad apple. You know, it, I mean, I would never turn around and say the whole of chiropractic is, is uh, over treats and overcharges. Like there, there's, that's a tiny, tiny, tiny aspect. Just like osteopathy, you know, there's bad practitioners in all professions. I think it's really important. The problem is we're not researching. Physios are researching. Chiros are researching. Osteos, we don't research as well as we do, as well as we should do. We're not, we're not putting stuff out there because there's no money in it. Like I've published research. In 18 months, it took us to write the um, HVLA research. We didn't get paid for it. It was a lot of work and effort and no one fucking read it. Well, my mum read it. But, um, <laughs> you know, in order for us to validate what we do and not, not be seen as sort of holistic quacks, we have to, we have to publish. And we've got to put ourselves up there for, for criticism. And like I said, I'm happy to be criticised. I'm happy to be. I don't care. You know, I think an open, honest debate is really important. But you're never going to get that on social media. It's just... Yeah. butting heads and, and, and that's know, the negativity of it as jeff says what if pain relief reduction doesn't happen in the consult room well this is where as you said before uh, that's some the, other yeah. that you talk about i mean manual therapy isn't the only modality for manual therapists osteopaths are not just manual therapists we're practitioners who use therapeutic touch manual therapy soft tissue manipulation mobilization as a tool amongst a plethora of many, many others. You know, one of the biggest mistakes I made as a, as, a, as a fresh graduate was I wanted every patient to leave my treatment room pain-free doing a cartwheel, right? <laughs> and, and I wanted to give five-star service at three-star prices. And I wanted to be the best of the best. I wanted to be, like I said, Top Gun. Yeah, Tom Cruise, bring it on. But in, in reality, I was more like Goose. I was more... I, 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 the, the biggest thing for me was managing patients' expectations, telling them listen you've had this for freaking six years you're not going to walk out of here doing a cartwheel being completely pain-free i am absolutely fine with patients leaving in pain and discomfort i'm i'm absolutely fine with it as long as it's all part of the management plan dealing with patient expectations uh, you know if you do get that immediate result amazing happy days fantastic but don't always expect it um you know Patient management is massively important. We get lazy sometimes with our terminology, which is where patients misinterpret. Like with manipulation, because it's such a visceral thing, right? Patients misinterpret what it is that we're actually doing. And, you know, I've had patients come in to me and, and it's the classic, just reposition my pelvis. Can you put my ribs back in? So it's really important. We do create good dialogue, not just interprofessionally, but with our patients because, you know, they have access to social media too. And they're seeing all this stuff and they're expecting miracles. And it's like, listen, mate, it's not going to happen. I, I, I'm very open. I've got prolapses in my lower back and I'm like, listen, I'm not going to cure that but I am going to manage it. So I have long periods of pain free life, but it will flare up a bit. And when it does, I calm down and I deal with it. That's what we need to get you to be, yeah. you know? Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Absolutely. You know, and I guess in, in summary, I mean, we could talk about this all morning for you and all night for me, but it is I mean, manu manual therapy is, is used with a clinical rationale for a desired outcome. And, you know, even if it, the technique does temporarily reduce pain or improve movement, ultimately we need exercise re rehabilitation prescription all encompassing 
to create tissue resilience for the long term, education, understanding, delivery Look, is key, and you know, patient centered care moving forward. It's I think I'm, I'm not on this. I'm not going to crack a joint unless I have clinical rationale to do it. Right? I'm not going to do a manual therapy technique unless I'm do, I have a clinical rationale as to why I'm going to do something, and that's key. Right? You have to understand why you're doing something and what the desired outcome you're trying to achieve is. Right? Otherwise, you might as well be a prescription therapist. Right? You might as well just use the same five techniques for everybody. You know, the flying seven. You might as well just do the same thing. We have to have adaptability, variability, and use the techniques appropriate to that patient. I love manual therapy because it is a very, very quick and fast way that I can help uh, modulate that person's presenting symptoms. I can teach them things that they can do on their own to help reduce that pain and to get them back living their life and moving as optimally as I want. Because ultimately, what's my goal? My goal is for them to have pain-free movement. That's what I want. I want them to have pain-free movement. And I don't give a monkeys how I get there. I want them to have pain-free movement because pain, it, it's all encompassing to that person. That's all they ever think about. When you, what I read a great quote, when you're in pain, it's all you can think about. It's like oxygen. When you have it, you don't even acknowledge it. But when you don't have it, it's like all you can freaking think about. Mm -hmm. So for me, pain-free movement, and I don't care how we do it. We use the techniques, we educate, we, we, we create tissue resilience, but also we don't forget that what they're doing off the table. And bear in mind, that's not just about exercise rehab, lifestyle changes, stress management. Mate, we, we work in it. We live in a world where it's 24 seven stress, mobile phones, stress, something as simple as getting your patients to turn their phone off an hour before bed, getting them to have a good night's sleep can be way more therapeutic than exercise and manual therapy. Yeah. Teaching them mindfulness, being in the moment, some of this sort of stuff, is, is hugely important and i think when we encompass it all together that's a really powerful package it really is a powerful package i think you know speaking for some of the for some of the critics out there hearing you say pain-free getting rid of pain pain-free movement our relationship patient's relationship our understanding of pain is changing a lot and there are some people that would argue that we should be encouraging and educating people on pain and being able to live with pain rather than this push towards making people pain free. What do you say to those people? Right. I mean, it's, it's first. Okay, fine. Pain, pain free is, is the, my goal is to get you pain free. That would be the ideal. Are we ever going to get there? Maybe, maybe not. But that's realism. That's being realistic. The, the key for me is to say to the patient, right, your body's robust. Your body is strong. You're not going to break. You're going to get through this. You know, you're, you, the reason why your lower back is painful is because it's sensitized, right? It's sensitized. For me, the ideal position would, you to be, would for you to be pain free, but it's going to take time. And ultimately, it's about self-management. Yeah, we can educate patients about pain, but in reality, most patients... Are you really going to sit there and have a long-term discussion about, about, about pain and, and how, it, how it affects them? It's, it's very difficult in a 30-minute 30-minute appointment. We do our very best. It's you know, hard enough to talk to them about why their back is hurting or what could be causing that. Um, I think education is key. Telling them that they are going to be resilient, telling them the body is resilient, and not to worry about being in a bit of discomfort. Like when I say to my patients, exercise, but it hurts a bit. That's fine, man. Don't worry about it. Work up to a five out of 10, six out of 10. Give them the comfort and the knowledge that they're not going to cause them. This is the problem with fear avoidance, right? We want to, we want to make sure they understand that they are not going to do themselves significant harm by having a bit of discomfort when they exercise because they then may not exercise if they're worried it's causing them pain. And that can be the worst thing ever. So I think it's about, I think it's about patient expectations and about management. Look, my, my goal is for you to have pain-free periods of time, right? But there will be times where your back will be sensitized. Your joint will be sensitized. Not to worry about that. That's fine. We will give you the mechanisms to cope with it. You know, this is how we, this is how we'll do it. So uh, I think we have to find a balance. We have to find a balance between, you know, all of that process, giving the patient enough education, but not too much. 
because you can bamboozle them with 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 pain science all day long you know you can bamboozle them um i think it's about being realistic ultimately exactly and my my last question for you and i know that you you i guess humored us with your example of an osteopath and physio creating a love child and the, and the future <sighs> of manual therapy. I mean, you know, that that's great in context, but on a, on a really serious note, where, what do you, what do you see for the future of manual therapy? Is, is, are we going to find unicorns and rainbows and all come together with our philosophies and our common ground, which is to help people, not necessarily to fix people. Is there a place for us Obviously, yes, we are doing this right now. We're all learning from each other. But is there a, I guess, you know, a big overarching profession that is a combination of chiro, physio, osteo? Well, do you know what? I, I'll be honest. About 15 years ago, I would sit in a, I'd sit in a, um, a lecture room and I would be able to tell you who did what, right? I could sit there and go, Physio, physio, osteo, osteo, physio, chiro, chiro, physio, easy. Fast forward 15 years and I'm sat in a, te- a lecture room with 20, 30 people. I don't know who is who. I, I can't tell who is the physio, osteo or chiro because unless they've got it written on their top, we're all coming, we're all, we're all doing the same techniques. We're all coming at it from the same sort of edu- we've all got the same similar education we might we might have different philosophies but we're doing very very similar things um and there's such an amalgamation now um i would say 15 years ago there was a clear separation but but now it's it's really sort of mashed up do you know what i i think to be fair in the future there may be an amalgamation of professions um you know, I, I could see that happening. At the moment, you've got three distinctly different professions with different philosophies, but those philosophies are, 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 are old now. There's a, lot, there's a lot of old stuff. Are we going to see an amalgamation of it all? I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I love osteopathy. I love the philosophy. I love how we look at the person, and I wouldn't want to lose that identity. But I also see there's massive flaws in osteopathy and osteopathic education that could be that could be um, plugged by physiotherapy and chiropractic and, and different, uh, different clinical practices together. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. Um, cause like I said, I, like, I love the profession, but I do see so many flaws in it that need to be addressed. Um, I'm hoping that we can all work together as, as like a beautiful unicorn rainbow family, but there's always going to be clashes of ego. There's always going to be clashes of tribalism. There's always going to be, you know, I'm better than you. You're better than me. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. What do you think? I, I think, you know, in, in an ideal world and what, what science is, is forcing upon us is, is to chase the evidence and to be backed by evidence. One of the things that is really, really difficult when it comes to manual therapy is you can't have these double blinded studies. No, People no. know when they're being touched and when they're not, it's not like you can give half a, a, a testing group, um, you know, this one pill and the other one, another, you know, we can't do double blinded studies and we are doing more and more. And this, this is happening. There's a lot more physios out there. There's a lot more money in physios. There's a lot more research to back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, which, you know, but, but I think that we are coming up from behind. I think osteopathy is mm. a, a bit of a, a Bradbury. And I do, I think that we, we, we are, and we are positioned at the round table now and people are, are watching because we do chase the, the science and we do follow the research and manual therapy has got a place as does exercise science, exercise prescription and movement is medicine. So collectively, if every single individual profession is looking at the evidence, then we're all going to find ourselves in, in the middle of the, of the dartboard really yeah i think we we are going to we are going to come together i think what what we do need to do though is we need to like in the uk 80 percent of the population don't know what osteopath is or what an osteopath does right it's a massive problem in the uk and i think for us as a profession we need to be screaming from the rooftops what we can do what we do do and and show evidence-based research show evidence-based and we need to be writing and publishing, right? There's not enough of us, but you're, you're, what you're doing is fantastic. A massive platform bringing professions together. You know, what I'm doing is I'm trying to bring professions together to say, look, manual therapy is effective. 
I don't care about your title. These are the tools that we can have and can use at our disposal and use them as you want to for these reasons. We need to be showing people what we do and why we do it so well. There's no point in being the best freaking osteopath if no one knows where the fuck you are. Uh, you know, there's, there's no point in being the best of the best if, if, you're, if you're at home on, you know, and you're not in clinical practice or you're not showing people. So I think it's really important we, we as a collective, as a profession, push forward in research and publication and not be scared to say, hold on a minute, I'm an osteo. This is what I think. And this is what we do because the physios, they're not scared, man. They're not scared. They're shouting out all day long and fair play to them because, you know, they're the ones out there giving, you know, giving it large. And, but we should be doing the same thing. We can turn around and go, well, actually we can do this too. And we can do this, this, and this. Yeah. So I think it's really important that the upcoming generation of osteopaths don't just fixate on being in clinical practice how are you going to promote the profession to the wider community? Because you, it's on you. It's on you to help us to show people what we can do. Otherwise, we are going to get swallowed by other bigger professions. And we are good at what we do. You know, I might not agree with a lot of or some of my colleagues as uh, you know, it is what it is. I'm very medical based, but we need to show what we do and why we do it so well. Um, and I think that's why these platforms are so important. You know, they really are. And that's, that's the best part of emotional intelligence is understanding and championing your strengths and your weaknesses, whether it be yeah. an individual or as a profession and then aligning and also cross referring when you might not be the best person to help and actually removing your you know, ego. There you go. Do you know what? I always say, don't be afraid to refer, right? Uh, right. I don't treat, I don't treat pregnant patients. Well, firstly, don't get your patients pregnant because that will get you struck off, but I don't treat pregnant patients <laughs> because that's a specialism so i refer to someone who is specialized in that field i don't i don't treat you know so i'm happy to refer to people who are more knowledgeable than i am and i think it, it, the problem is we we graduate we sit in our little clinic rooms like freaking golem right on our own and uh, you know and we oh no don't don't take my patients away my precious no i want to keep my patients good dude man do your thing don't be afraid to refer to other practitioners. My patients, when I say to them, listen, actually, I don't think what I'm doing is, is, is going to help. I'm going to refer you to my colleague. But I refer to physios and chiros all the time. My patients love it that I'm cross-referring. We have to work together. You know, like I always say, as an island, you know, as a silo, you, you, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Don't be afraid. But when there's money involved, when patients are involved, people do get very sort of Lord of the Rings. They sort of, you know, they don't want to give up patients. And it's like, actually, that's ego. You're right. Put the ego at the door. Leave it at the door and, and don't worry about it. And, it's true. and I think I think that's why it is it is a privilege to be talking to someone like yourself and hearing your voice. You know, you are a voice and not an echo. And we're, we're very grateful to have you. And I'm really grateful to have spent the last hour with you, as has everybody else watching. There's been some <laughs> no, my pleasure, man. And, Sorry, I'll waffle all day long. <laughs> hopefully a, a little bit of, of controversy now you can head back to your day. But for those people watching at home who do want to uh, find you, find more about you. I mean, you've got over a hundred thousand followers on, on your platform. You, you do have a big social media following. There are a lot of people that, you know, particularly over here for amongst my students and amongst my staff, you've got a bit of a cult following here in Australia and, and deservingly. So how can we find you? What courses have you got? Can we find you online? Yeah. I mean, like we do, um, we've got OMT training is the academy that we run. We've got online training courses that we also run. Um, and you can follow us on OMT training official on Instagram, Facebook. Um, and like I said, I, I think it's important that, you know, you contact us, we can debate, we can discuss. Uh, and I think it's really important that, you know, you back, we back up what we say, you know, so you can find us on all those social media platforms. And if you are on Tinder, I'll be there as well. So, you know, it's no problems. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. From no worries. Down, down under, down here, down under, up there in the UK. 
Um, hopefully, Megan and Harry aren't taking too much of your spotlight over there. Oh, don't, man, don't. It's like, I oh, had to, don't. I had to. In the What's end. it? Brexit, Megan and Harry, oh, freaking COVID. It's, oh, don't. This is why I'm losing my hair. It's the yeah. stress. It's the stress. <laughs> uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your no energy worries. and everything that you bring to osteopathy, allied health, and manual therapy around the world. It's been awesome. Sorry for the swearing. I apologize. <laughs> lucky, lucky we did it after kids are in bed. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. See you later. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.